Good afternoon, and thanks for joining the Insolvency and Restructuring Key Trends for Half One 2023 uh, with Ambition. Um, firstly, before we even get started, I want to just say thank you to anyone that's joined, uh, and also thanks to anybody that's actually answered our surveys over the last few weeks, months, um, and hopefully off the back of this, you'll be able to get uh, some insights from off the back of that. Um, so before we get any, go any further, let's do some introductions for those that haven't had the pleasure of dealing with with myself. Um, my name is Chris Stark. Um, I'm Divisional Manager at Ambition uh, in our advisory team, which covers insolvency, restructuring and corporate finance. Uh, Harmon? Hi, I'm Harmon. I'm a senior consultant um, and I specialise in mid-level appointments within insolvency and restructuring. Great. Um, conscious, obviously, of time, so we won't hesitate any longer and we'll get straight into things. Uh, so, over 2020, um, well, ever since mid-2020, the government you know, stepped in to help businesses amidst the COVID pandemic. Um, and we've been waiting for the wave of insolvencies to hit the UK. Um, 2022, it felt like we were kind of getting there. Um, and there was a bit of an uptick, but we think most people thought that you know, this year would, would be a lot busier. Um, so we, we asked our clients, how did they find last year compared to 2021? Um, as expected, most people were expecting it to be, you know, did find it to be busier, not exactly everybody. Um, when we asked people the question of how they expect this year to go, um, probably the only time where we've actually got IPs to be completely in agreement with each other um, in that pretty much everyone, well, literally everybody here um, expected 2023 to be busier uh, than 2022. Um, off the back of that, we asked people, do you expect to grow your team um, by Nick making new hires in the first half of 2023? So the key part around that is we're talking new hires here, not replacing people that have left or they're going on maternity leave or retiring or, or whatever that may be. These are growth hires. Um, so asking that question, I find that basically three quarters uh, of our respondents said yes to that question. They expect to grow their teams. Um, kind of makes sense if you expect the market to be busier it makes sense that now is probably quite a good time where either it's a good time to grow the team in expectation or just out of necessity because you know, people are swamped with work. Um, what we've also seen off the back of that, though, is that there's probably going to be a supply and demand problem. Um, so we asked you know, candidates, how likely is it that you will be changing jobs in the first half of 2023? So how much, how much chance is there that you're going to be in the market? Um Basically, the results we find there is almost the complete inverse of what the supply, uh, what the demand is. Um, so most people ultimately are not looking to make a move, at least straight away at the start of this year. Um, could be a number of reasons for that. Um, can be just sometimes people don't want to people want to see how the first half of the year goes before making any sort of big, you know, big life decision, which moving jobs always is. Um, obviously, we've had JIB results come out in March. A lot of people actually wait for those results and then they make their decisions based off that as to whether they'll stay, whether they'll maybe have to reset or, or what they may do off the back of that. And just generally, with everything going on in the world in terms of the economy, you know, cost of living crisis, um, instability typically makes people what seek stability in some area of their life. And you know, your job is obviously what most people spend most of their time doing. Um, so if there's a lot of chaos going on outside, it might not be the most conducive time to move for a lot of people. Um, Harman, I know you're probably seeing this sort of supply and demand issue even more than I am, but have you got any sort of parts you want to add on to that? I don't think so, but I think the next slide follows on quite nicely from that. Um, so as you can see, admins, senior admins, um, are the level of seniority that's most in need. And I think that's worth stressing here is this is when people were asked, what's the level you most need? Um, which obviously is admins um, followed by senior admins. Um, it's not the case that there's no requirements for juniors, AMs or directors. We're placing people at all of those levels and we're, we're receiving requirements at all of those levels. It's just a case of if you ask someone what they need the most, the answer is, usually an admin or a senior admin um so i think something that's quite interesting is that um yeah admins and senior admins that makes up 76 percent of demand whereas when we did our last webinar so i think the survey for that was september-ish kind of time last year um since then it's jumped up 13 percent um and it was already 
there was already a supply and demand issue back then so it's just worse well for companies it's just worse now um it's a lot more competitive um we've seen an uptick in in manager as well here um so because there are a lot of admins and senior admins that joined new companies um last year naturally you need the people to actually manage those staff um but yeah uh, i think it's uh it's it's a funny old market at the moment but if you're an admin or a senior admin then great for you yeah it's probably there's never been a better time to have sort of between one and four years experience because you're the person that everyone everyone wants to see at the moment um there's people getting you know multiple i think you spoke you've worked with people that have had what four more offers you know that that sort of level um so yeah there's a lot of demand for people at that sort of level um we'll go on to um always an interesting point which is around pay um Armin, do you want to talk through this bit sure um so yeah when we asked people if it had a, a pay increase in the last 12 months 80 percent roughly said yes 20 percent roughly said no um so i mean that really should be a hundred percent to be honest um regardless of level um so if you're in that just under a fifth of people that haven't had an increase in the last 12 months then i mean unless you were significantly over market rate when you maybe moved um or you know sort of came into that position um the chances are um or it's, it's probably highly likely that you're now lagging behind the rest of the of the market and your peers at other companies um so then the next question um we asked was what percentage increase did you receive if you got an increase um so kind of most people sitting between that three to 15 percent um obviously that varies quite a lot um but some most people somewhere in the middle of there um something i probably would highlight is that um probably unless you were promoted um or achieved a qualification um i would argue we didn't ask this question but i would argue that a good chunk of that 11 percent of people uh 21 percent and above probably move jobs to get that pay increase either that or they handed in the notice and they were then counter offered um you know that's that's a lot that's a massive increase to get you don't just get that in a in an annual review on the standard you might get a few grand here and there but to get over 20 percent there must be something there aside from promotion it, it has to be a job move um with the market as it is at the moment um if you're a highly valued member of staff um and the team want to retain you particularly if you're an admin or a senior admin um then yeah it's likely you could probably get an increase like that either by an external move or actually from a counter offer yeah i think it's also interesting that yeah the most common level is uh six to ten percent um which depending on who you speak to that's kind of where inflation was by the back end of, of last year um so again I think it feels like most companies maybe if they are offering salary increases it's to keep in in you know in line with inflation whether that still counts as a pay rise um if you're not actually seeing any benefit in your back pocket at the end of the day when all, you, all your bills go up um that's probably a much wider societal problem um that um certainly me and Harm are not going to be able to fix or, or any number of recruiters unfortunately um so one other question we've we've brought in to the survey was around bonuses um because we feel like it's something that's becoming more a consistent question um so we just asked very simply um did you receive a bonus in the last 12 months because we think we need, we didn't really know in honestly how common that was in the market i don't think many people see insolvency restructuring as a as an industry that's heavy on bonuses or where there's a high bonus sort of culture uh certainly not like corporate finance or or obviously investment banking where that's kind of what draws a lot of people into that into that industry um but it's still yeah, a significant chunk of people received a bonus but and then on the same side we're talking over a third of people didn't get any bonus at all um and then also at the back of that next question is obviously what sort of bonus did are you getting um in, and how we measure that is obviously percentage of your base salary um most interesting there is I guess the it's quite a widespread um and it's also important to note that anyone that replies to these questions they're anonymous so we can't find out what level they are so obviously if you're a director you probably like to get a higher percentage bonus in comparison to maybe someone with one year experience that's kind of a given 
Um, but there is a, a fairly widespread here. So it's it's still hard for us to really pick out what's the industry standard here. Um, I'm not even sure if it, it, there really is an industry standard. Maybe there's, we're saying sort of, you know, anything over 10% south looks to be quite, you know, probably the outliers. Um, most people are getting somewhere between five and 10 uh, or, you know, one and 10%. Um, but yeah, I think there's, this is something that more employers can really look at as how can they make themselves more marketable? You know, how can they make themselves look more attractive in the market? Um, Harman, I think you've you've had a few sort of crossings with with people talking about bonuses. I feel like it's a question you get asked a lot more often nowadays. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say, um, I mean, obviously most people get below 10% if they get a bonus at all. Um, so I think if you're, this is something to the high managers, I don't think it's something we touch on at the end of this webinar um, that we've sort of bullet pointed. But if you're a company that historically, you know, average averages out over 10% in terms of bonus, make sure that you actually advertise that. Um, obviously, it's discretionary. You can never guarantee it. But for example, we work with a client that bonus tends to range up to, depends what you know profits are, but up to 20%, but it's never dipped below 10% um, since, I think, 2012 or 2013. Um, but they weren't telling candidates that in the interview. Um, if that candidate get, gets three other offers, they're all at 50K and yours has a bonus that could be like a significant bonus of at least five grand on top of that 50k. Um, but they're actually not aware of that until maybe the very end of the process and it might be too late. So um, if you do offer bonuses and strong bonuses at that, um, then advertise it. Um, but any bonus is worth mentioning to people because money is one of the most, well, when we did this survey, it was the number one motivator for candidates and it probably will continue to be it's always up there. Um, no one works for free. So um, if you do offer any bonus at all, then mention that even if it's less than 5%, because um, yeah, just under 40% of people haven't received a bonus in the last 12 months. And, and maybe another thing to actually add on is again, probably more advice for, for hiring managers and people that are kind of in the position of power here is, is, is sometimes it's not the actual volume of bonus that's, that actually is important to people. Sometimes it's actually the clarity of how is that bonus allocated um you know nine times out of ten if if i speak to someone and they're unhappy with their bonus it's not necessarily the volume of, of money they've received that they're unhappy about it's that they feel that it wasn't clear why they've received that or why maybe someone else has received more um and it seems almost like it's very murky and opaque as to how that structure works um obviously i don't expect clients necessarily tell us how their internal structures and how their bonuses are paid out. That's quite in, you know, personal and sort of sensitive information, but I think all employees should, it should be very, very clear how you're remunerated. I mean, you know, our job, for example, is very much commission focused and everyone here knows how it works. Um, so it makes you literally know how at the end of each month, how you've been paid. Um, it's quite an important thing to sort of add in there as well, I think. Um, so we also asked um, clients around, are they offering anything additional you know, to help with the rise, rising cost of living? Um, it's, it's something we mentioned towards the back end of last year. Unfortunately, that's a problem that is, I don't think is going away anytime soon. Um, so we'd heard, of, I guess, a few anecdotal sort of references that you know, employees were receiving additional you know, co you know, payments or in, you know, enhanced bonuses or even early pay reviews. Uh, so we wanted to get a bit more clarity on how many people were actually getting this. It's still, obviously, the majority of people are just being sort of you know, paid their normal amount. Um, but it was, you know, I guess, encouraging to see that are, there is at least a percentage of firms out there that are trying their best to do something. Um, I think there's been some quite innovative ideas. Uh, I think the one that, that caught our eye the most was um, there was one firm that you know, was com contributed to people's uh, utility bills. I think it was a manager grade and below. Um, they weren't paying for the whole lot, but they were paying for a, a significant chunk of it. Um, and again, I think even that that small that small outlay, um, you know, especially when you're starting out in your career, if you've only really just moved out of out of home, that could actually be a quite big difference. Um, that's made the difference between you know struggling to pay all your bills and actually giving yourself a bit of breathing room. Um, Han, were there any other ones that you've sort of seen out there in the market? Um, there are a few, um, but again, um, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm 
36 percent of my clients and we pretty much work with everyone haven't told me that they offer this stuff um i'm only aware of a few um so i think again to hire managers tell us at least um what it is especially tell candidates but if you're expecting us to you know sell your opportunities in the marketplace and compare them to 20 others um it needs to have not just a USP in terms of the casework, the progression, or the kind of standard stuff, but importantly, um, stuff like this, which really does make you stand out. Yeah, ultimately, it's something to be to be really proud of as a company if you offer anything like this. Um, and it, again, I don't I don't think it necessarily needs to be a huge huge outlay. I say it can be sim- just as simple as offering an early salary review for people. Um, if, if people, are, if things are massively spiking in costs, like maybe bringing forward the salary reviews a few months. Again, it, that could be the massive difference for, for some people. Um, so we'll move on to um, flexible working practices. Harman, this is yeah, yep. the area of expertise. Um, so asking candidates, would you be interested in remote working? Most of people wouldn't. Um, just over 10% are very interested um, and then 27% somewhat interested. Um, and then interestingly, we then ask the same questions to clients. Um, so similarly, most people said no, um, 16% said yes, and 20% were unsure. Um, so it would seem as though those two match up quite nicely in terms of demand, um, in terms of what well, openness to it, at least. Um, so I think the remote the remote working market is something that's going to grow a lot this year. Um, it definitely picked up last year. I placed, I actually generally lost count of how many remote candidates I placed last year, but it was a lot. Um, it's something where, I mean, demand is high for it. Um, and I think that what is difficult for people that are looking for remote work is that the choice and variety of remote roles on offer is quite poor. Um, it tends to be one type of one specific type of firm. Um, generally, it tends to be roles where it's, for example, like a, a post appointment um, CVL team, for example. Um, and you know, it offers flexibility. They can do it part time. It's remote. Um, I think that's the that's the driving thing from the candidate side. Um, is typically it's a people with maybe young children. Um, they need to work around the school run um want to save money on the commute whatever it might be but flexibility is the key thing there um i think it's important to note that um this is not people that are lazy um or not career motivated or anything like that um this is just candidates that are at a point in their life where they want to work from home um it's not that they you know want to sit with their feet up um it's it's genuinely really really great candidates um equally as strong as any candidates I place in office-based roles. It's just that they want to work remotely. It's not going to work for all companies, um, but there's, um, I mean, 13% of the market is still thousands of people. Um, and, you know, that's a massive candidate pool that I believe is still relatively untapped. Um, so I think instead of seeing where we see 20% of clients that are unsure um, about remote workers, you know, increasing i think that's going to decrease and that's going to decrease into yes i think more people are going to hire remotely we've already seen that in the past week people that were never open to it that have sort of said yeah let's do it we can't find the local candidates and we think it could work for us let's go for it um so i think yeah as time goes on there'll be more opportunities for those for remote staff yeah uh, i totally agree with you on on how i think the sentiment will change around it i think you know even compared to what it was three years ago, if we'd done the, if we, we probably wouldn't even ask this question three years ago, you know, pre COVID, it would have just been a, a moot point because the answer would have been categorically no from pretty much everybody. Um, and I think most candidates probably wouldn't even really thought it was a, a realistic proposition. Um, I think our advice again for, for anyone that's again, maybe considering the, their firm as maybe we should look into this. Um, we're happy to sort of give as much information as we can in terms of like, you know, obviously some of our clients do offer this already and we can kind of give some insights as to how they make it work, you know, what sort of things are they putting in place? Cause it's not something you can just click your fingers and make happen. Um, there's also the logistical side of it in terms of how do you, do you set them up and all the equipment that needs to be sent over and, and how does that actually work? But it's even things around how do you maintain a 
uh, a company culture with people that are based all across the country. Um, you know, some people are very active on you know, having lots and lots of FaceTime via video calls um, or really pushing their social events. You know, they're not going to be all every you know, couple of weeks. They're going to be maybe once a quarter, but really pushing hard to get as many people to, to make the trip down. So they, you know, even if people are remote working, um, they feel like they're still connected. I think, you know, I know one of our clients, you know, their HR team are, are excellent in terms of just keeping keeping in touch with people um, and just making sure that if there's any problems, they feel like they've actually got someone that knows them. Um, and it's not just always every time they're on a video call, it's, it's checking up on how, how their case is going. So they actually feel like they've got some sort of, you know, friends basically, because it can, it can be quite a lonely this all existence working remotely. Um, so it's, it's something that companies need to look at. But I would encourage anybody that's in that unsure column to reach out to us. You know, if you don't want to speak to us, speak to people in the market because there are companies that are making it work really, really well for them. Um, and I think, like, as I just said, oh, there's, a, there's an untapped market there, which given what we've already mentioned about how competitive it is to hire, um, it's it's a bit of a no-brainer to, to at least be exploring, I think, for most companies out there to at least have considered it. Uh, Alvin, do you want to talk about the uh, the hybrid working patterns? So, yeah, most places it's, it's anchor days um, or at the manager's discretion. Um, and then, yeah, again, I think the, the only interesting point on this was days averaged over a period of time. I'm not actually aware of any companies that operate in that way. Um, I, there's a couple of clients we work with where they offer nine day fortnights um but that's something entirely different i think days averaged over a period of time i've not really seen that much so i'd be interested to know which places those are but um yeah most places it's anchor days self-explanatory there you have a day um or two or however many in the week where everyone in the team is expected to be in um and that stops the kind of loss of um, you know, if one person's in one day and another's in another day, they may just not see each other for weeks on end. Um, and then it just helps that sort of team team cohesion, keep everyone together and happy, hopefully. Um, at the manager's discretion, I'll let you talk about that one, Chris, because you're a manager. <laughs> um, I mean, at the manager's discretion, I mean, I guess that means that obviously if, if there's times where you're really, really busy and you've got a job that just needs to be done, then you, you know, you might want to get people in there. Um, I guess that's kind of how we operate ambition. Probably that's probably how our team works. It's technically my discretion, but I think I'm pretty easy going. Um, um, yeah, I think most, I think most companies probably operate a bit of a blend in all honesty in that there's, yeah, there's, there's anchor days, but a manager can, can step in and go actually you know what i need you to come in on a wednesday this week it, you know can you do that but then on the same vein there's an element of you know, each employee has has the ability to change things around you know they might typically go on a tuesday and thursday but you know that's you know thursday's not going to work for them this week can they do you know tuesday wednesday i think again it's, it's about having a bit of clarity um i think um also while having flexibility and keeping it kind of open-ended is great in practice, I do think in a hiring process, it's it's really important for those that are doing the interviews to be pretty clear on what that actually is and what does that actually mean. Because if you know, it's it's very well saying we trust our staff and you know trust us to to be flexible, but I think particularly when someone's maybe leaving a company, um, leaving a company where they maybe had their fingers burned previously around flexible working, maybe they were promised a lot and it's not been delivered on. They probably want something in writing that's actually going to confirm, okay, what are my actual days that I'm in there? Um, so I think sometimes we have had you know people that have interviewed and maybe the, they've asked around hybrid working and it's been quite vague. Um, and it might be quite vague because they genuinely are so open and it's literally any, anything goes, but that can be sometimes quite almost daunting for someone that doesn't really know any, doesn't really know that company um so that's just something to, to keep in mind there um i've just seen someone's put on the in the q a but days averaged over a period of time dash two two three days a week um i think um i mean i, I would imagine that would probably be individuals because that's what we've got we're in twice a week um but it's the individual's discretion i tend to choose tuesdays and thursdays um i think that because the hybrid policy is the hybrid policy, but I think that days 
average over a period of time might be over the course of a fortnight or a month maybe i don't know that's interesting though yeah i think i think if i know when we haven't done previous surveys i think our last i think our last webinar we covered you know how many days are people going in i think i think three days was the most popular and then two was the most popular um and i think like four and one are like the two extremes and then five being probably the, the outlier really five and zero are the outliers um where again there's not many companies we know now that are getting people to come in five days a week all the time maybe if, the, if things really hit the fan and it goes really really busy then maybe that might happen once in a, once in a blue moon and, and same with you know zero times a week again most people unless they're they're set remote workers they're typically coming in at least once again unless something's going on at home where they're being allowed to have a, a week where they just need to work from home maybe they, they, maybe someone's ill or or whatever it may be at, at home that's making them need to do that um but yeah i mean so from my perspective the days average over, over a period of time wouldn't be my choice just on pure convenience level um i don't like having to track people how often they're coming in so that might be why that's probably the least common one i think it's just because the most admin involved with tracking um harman you want to talk through advice for job seekers sure um so basically it's a candidate's market um supply is relatively well it's not low it's just relatively stable the supply is what the supply is the demand is what's increasing um and there's there's not the supply to to satisfy that demand so basically it's a candidate's market um i think for anyone that's not considered options since before or just before um the, the pandemic um consider your options basically the number of vacancies back then was far lower um and as sort of explained on the slide here it's it's possible that you're blind to the, the current state of play in the market um so first bit of advice would be keep tabs on salary guides probably the biggest piece of advice i would say just because they keep going up and up particularly if you're an admin or a senior admin um if you if, if you are an admin or a senior admin um and you're not within the bandings listed that we will go through in a minute give either of, of us a, a call um and we'll, and, and we'll sort of talk you through what what other people have been offered recently because it's absolutely mental i think um i think even our salary guide as it is now is not not out of date because we only did it what a couple of months ago um yeah. it's just that now some of the offers i'm getting don't fit into those bandings um it's it's nuts um so yeah keep keep tabs on salary guides review your position um so whether that be um are you doing the kind of case where you 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 know you want to do are you at the right level in your career that you expect to be at this stage? Um, you know, are you actually enjoying your job? Um, just sometimes it's easy just to get your head down and slog it out and just think it would all kind of work out. Um, sometimes it might, but most of the time it actually won't. You need to have a plan of attack for the future. Um, someone submitted a question, which I'll go over at the end about advice for people earlier on in their career, um, which yeah i'll follow on to that point later um and then seek advice um the best people to speak to um well obviously we would argue is is specialist recruiters um so we're immersed in the market every single day we speak for hours and hours on the phone every week to thousands of candidates over the course of a year and clients at various different levels all across the country and sometimes globally um both hiring managers um and yeah candidates so we have an accurate snapshot of what's going on in the market at any one time whether that's salary whether that's culture if you know if people are leaving a certain company for a particular reason and that's one of the reasons you're leaving there we can tell you that the company's definitely not going to advertise that um and when you interview them, they probably won't, won't tell you that but we can um because we didn't work for any of these companies um, we represent them, but we also represent you. And it's a candidate's market at the moment. So I think that's what people need to remember. Um, but I think uh, misconception is that you have to speak to a recruiter only if you're looking for a job, but that's not actually the case. Um, I'd like to think we're quite we're quite consultative. Um, and our default sort of suggestion when people call us up for the first time is usually, can you fix the issue where you're at at the moment? Um, because selfishly i suppose we don't want to waste our time um with people that can just fix the situation where they're at, at the moment we don't want to go through the whole process and you know waste everyone's time really sort of doing that if it could have been resolved in the first place so that's our first bit of advice if it can't be fixed 
then from there it's a case of okay well are your expectations achievable um are they realistic if they are then again then we, when we can help um but i think sometimes people think if i get on the phone to a recruiter they're just going to try and push me into the roles they're working on it's genuinely not the case um yeah i don't know if you've got any further points on that chris no i mean i'd echo a lot of what you said i think definitely around there's also a preconception around speaking to us that yeah if i have a conversation with with chris or Harmon, we're gonna have a conversation for 20 minutes and all of a sudden my cv is gonna be getting sent to every company in the land and that's really doesn't happen at all um a lot of the conversations certainly i have uh, uh, around you know saying maybe things actually aren't that bad in where your current place is you know i often have conversations with people do you think well, i'm being paid a fair salary i'll here go yes or maybe you might be able to get paid a little bit more but is everything else okay if everything else is okay then moving for an extra three or four grand probably isn't really worth it again everyone's got a price i think but i think a lot of our our job is actually just genuinely giving career advice it may be that actually you need to stick out for another year um you know maybe you're in the middle of studying for something maybe you need to get more experience in a certain area before you can make the move to where you want to go long term um but at the same time also i do think you need to be at least reviewing your position um you know i, I met with someone earlier this week who was, was very much you know saying they are very very happy but they and they they actually quite like where they work but their fear is around almost sleepwalking into the rest of their career and into their life almost in that they've been they've never even considered going somewhere else and that's again just doing your due diligence almost to at least say maybe the grass is greener you might look over the fence and it's not at all and actually you're in the perfect place for you with people that you really like that are paying you a fair wage and it's work you enjoy but maybe you can look over and go this is a seven out of 10, but maybe there's a nine out of 10 that I can go and get out of there. Um, you don't necessarily have to just settle for, yeah, I know this is what I know and this has worked okay for me so far. Um, so again, reach out to us and we can give you a, a fair, I'd like to say a, the most important thing, we'll give you an honest assessment. Um, you know, it's obviously our opinion. It's not the absolute gospel, but it's an honest opinion uh, of what we think is is reasonable. Um, I'll go into some advice for, for hiring managers. So, yeah, I think we bang our drum all the time that it's, it's a candidate's market. It's, you know, there's a lot of many candidates out there. Um, we're not just saying that um, you know, for, our, for our own sort of sake and just to cover up access to when someone says, why can't you find me a candidate? Not just because we're not just, we're not just making excuses. I think it's, it is genuinely true. Um, so I think one key thing to, to help with, with hiring if you are looking to grow your team is around how do you engage candidates? So we've touched on you know, highlighting your benefits, making your bonus uh, package you know, clear and obvious. And actually, you know, if it's really good, tell people about it. Um, consulting our salary guys, making your making sure that you're paying for what you want. If you want the absolute top you know, cream of the crop candidates, you're going to have to pay the, the big bucks for it. Um, that is kind of goes without saying in pretty much any other marketplace you would work, you know, you would deal in. Sometimes when it comes to recruitment, people want to try and get things on the cheap, but they still want the best the best quality and most skilled people out there. Um, but that doesn't just you know end with benefits and money. It's around the actual process itself. So, you know, we're hit, uh, hitting on one point here, which is around speed, but it's also around how do you do that interview process? Do you make it unnecessarily long and tedious in terms of extra stages that don't need to exist? Um, do you put the best people in front uh, of, of candidates? Um, so again, uh, we speak to you know a lot of clients that say, they offer great progression um, and they've got great examples of people that have come through the ranks and have you know risen really, really quickly, but then they don't let those people interview. And those are, to me, the, the best examples of what makes those companies great. You need to get those people out in front, in, in front of anyone that wants to join. You know, that's a great example and that's what people want to see. Um, get the people that really embody what you're about, um, that, that really you know symbolize your company, whatever that may be, and know what your USP is and then really almost you know, hang your hat on it as much as possible. Uh, if it's all about work-life balance, then really push it. If it's all really about doing the most interesting and most complex work possible, then, then that's great, own it. If it's all about you get paid the most, but you know what, it's, it's a pretty hard working environment. We, you know, we work hard, play hard. There's nothing wrong with that because some people love that. You know, every candidate and every person out there has a different you know, working environment that's right for them. I think you just need to know who it is you're trying to attract. And actually sometimes... 
I think there's a case of where some companies we work with, they're maybe trying to appeal to absolutely everybody. And you actually end up being quite vanilla doing that. And in a market like this, the, probably the, the last thing you want to be is vanilla. Um, having anything that sort of self separates you from the market um, so that someone can go, I, I know what they're about, um, is a great thing. Um, yeah, and on, on to speed. Yeah, we talked about how many processes there are that can be involved. Um, yeah, we're, we're speaking to candidates regularly that you know they're in multiple processes, not just through us. You know, maybe they've applied directly, maybe they're speaking to another agency. So if they're a good quality candidate, they're not on the market very long. Um, you know, I think Harmon's even spoke to people that have maybe even been made an offer. They're not really sure if it's the right offer for them. By the time they've received a contract, Harmon's already managed to get them another offer somewhere else. Now, that's obviously Partly, I'd like to go out amazing work by Harman, but also I'd also argue there's, there's people who are asleep at the wheel there. Um, I think that's a, and often the contract stage is where people can really let things slide. They've done all the really good hard work of getting a candidate really excited to be joining their company, made them a good offer, they've accepted. All they now need is something in writing, something that they can put their you know put their name on, and that can you know I've genuinely had examples where that's taken two weeks, and two weeks anything can happen. You know another job could come up in two weeks and someone else can move that much quicker, make them an offer, get the contract out. And you know what, they've met, they've gone with them now. Um, so speed at every stage, you know, uh, reviewing the CV, uh, giving feedback, uh, getting the contracts out there, all those parts of it are all important. Um, and when it comes to offers, yeah, we will always, if we're introducing someone's CV to a client, we'd always say, what is this person looking for in terms of a salary, in terms of you know, work, work-life work balance, all that sort of stuff. We would always clarify what they're looking for. Um, that isn't just us chancing our arm. And you're almost, you know, if someone says, I want, you know, 45, we don't just say 50 to try and just, you know, coin a little bit extra for ourselves. We say what they genuinely want. Um, if, if someone says to us that they're asking for a certain amount, we think that's genuinely just ridiculous and way over over what the market they're probably worth they would always say um they might then decide well, well i'll leave it up and i'll do it my own then which is perfectly there they're well within the rights but we thought i think that you know, we, we represent people to get what they deserve in the market based on what we've seen and based on what we know other people are being paid um again we can see where people have done great work in terms of the interview process and then it all comes crumbling down the offer where it's the attempt to try and get something just a little bit cheaper, just to try and do a deal. Can I can I shave two thousand off on what someone was originally asking for? And it just leaves a sour taste because ultimately the candidate's just going to come and ask for for the, what they actually originally asked for, and you're probably going to end up paying it anyway. Um, but it just makes the whole process more muddy than it needs to be, and it can take what's been a really nice experience for someone that potentially join your company and actually then it can put them off um, if they feel like that someone's trying to get them on the cheap ultimately. Um, and the last bit of advice, this is not really around hiring. It's around the other side of things. It's around retention. Um, yeah, the easiest way if you're trying to grow your team is not have people constantly leaving out the other way. Um, you know, it's certainly the cheapest way of doing it. Um, if you constantly have to hire, replace five people every year, it's going to be really hard to grow. Um, so I think all the things we mentioned around, you know, work-life balance, around remote offering, remote working, around having a clear bonus structure, paying the market rate. Um, can you do things around, you know, offering things to help with uh, the cost of living? Those all help with staff retention. Um, and I think that's, again, it goes, we, we know of definitely companies that are failing in this and we know of companies that are really, really good at it um, because we, whenever we catch up with anyone that works there, they're really happy and they're not looking to move because they've got several reasons that are keeping them there. And it's not just, and, and money is rarely the reason. It's generally all the other bits that come around it. Um, you know, being offered, you know, regular pay rise, it's not necessarily about the money. It's the fact that, that someone's actually taking the time and actually cares um, a lot of the time that makes people want to stay there, that they feel valued. Um, so I think that's a, that's a key thing at the moment, um, you know, keeping hold of your good people. Um, how did you have any sort of additional points you wanted to add on to that? Not really. Um, I think, yeah, make your best offer first. Some of those companies do just try and you know, I can see if we can get them on this. It's like, it's not going to, not going to work. It has to be what the candidate wants. If that's reasonable, that's what you should offer. Um, and that's always what we'll go after for candidates. Retention. Yeah. Um, self-explanatory. If you want to, if you want to hire, you don't want to lose people at the same time. Um, 
I think, yeah, sometimes it just comes a little bit too late with with counter offers and things. Um, if someone's ten grand under market rate, and then you give them ten grand once they've handed in the notice, they might take it, but they will always leave again at some point in the future. Um, it's like a common recruitment statistic that goes around like 80 percent of people that accept counter offer leave i don't know if that's actually true but a lot of them do the majority of them do because we get calls from them um so you may you may get someone to stay for for a little bit um but do that groundwork to begin with start it from once you make that candidate an offer retain them in that process get them to start um but then once they're there catch up with them regularly make sure they're happy if they're not happy if they're not happy and it's a, and and they request something that you can't deliver on i suppose you just have to be transparent there if they want a certain kind of experience that you can't offer you can't offer that kind of experience um but if it's stuff you can deliver on study support for example and you think they're worth keeping give it to them um someone else will that's the thing <laughs> um so i think retention is key yeah, um, I think one, uh, even one last thing again that, I mean, everyone always says that insolvency and restructuring is a really sort of incestuous, everyone knows everyone kind of market. I think people always underestimate how much people talk. Um, I think if you can get, if you start to get a bit of a re- reputation for having a lot of people leaving, it doesn't take that many people to be walking to leave within the same year to get that reputation, actually. It could be two or three people leaving a short sp- space of time, all of a sudden, the talk is that there must be something wrong there. It could those two, three people might have all left for perfectly valid reasons that are nothing to do with it being a bad place to work. But that is the perception then. And that's from our perspective, that's can be actually a really hard thing to overcome once someone gets that in their head that it's a bad place to work, even if they've never been there themselves, but they've heard it from someone else. Yeah, you know, it, it can be a very hard thing to combat. So that, that's something to always be just keep in mind. And again, that's it goes for when you're hiring as well even if you think that person isn't quite right, they should walk away at least thinking they're not right for me, but they're not a bad place to work. You wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily bad mouth you in the market because again, we have had times where someone's interviewed there previously and you could tell them they're going to tell their mates and go, I would never work for those guys again. Uh, or I never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let anyone else try and work for them almost. Um, anyway, um, so we'll go on to the bit that, a lot of people always want to see um, and, and talk about, which is around um, salary bandings. Um, we won't hes- sort of hold on to these slides too long because we've got different you know, sort of regions of the country and we've got different bandings for each ones. Um, obviously, we have these as PDFs. Um, so if anybody wants a copy of these, you obviously can go to our website. You can message myself, Harmon, or anybody else in the team. Um, we've all got these sort of readily accessible um, and almost kind of burn into our minds as well now um so I'll, I'll kind of flick through them fairly quickly um obviously as you expect london southeast is as it always has been pays probably higher than anywhere else in the country um and then every other region it varies but i typically sort of go somewhere between 10 15 percent as a knockoff typically but again that can vary massively depending on exactly where in the country we're talking um, and which sort of companies we're, t- we're dealing with. Um, you know, big four companies are always going to pay more. Um, you know, big consultancies is always going to pay more. Small boutiques typically are going are to pay a lot less. Um, I think you know, the key bit we always want to remind people here is these are guides. So if you're not in, any, if you're looking at any of these and go, that doesn't apply to me, um, either I'm way underneath uh, or I'm way over, it's worth having a conversation with us. We can maybe explain why. There might be a perfectly valid reason. Actually, it might be great news. You're over, you're, you're almost over market, which is probably the, the best part, of the, you know, place you want to be. Or if you're maybe not being paid the market rate, there might be a valid reason. Maybe you're being offered, you know, JIB support, and maybe that's kind of what's going to their decision making. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that might be the reason. Um, or it might be, maybe even our bandings aren't absolutely, you know, the most accurate in the world. Like we're, we're 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 going basically off you know people that we speak to people that we've helped find jobs and we're, we're trying to sort of collate that data as best we can um so we do have a section here for q and a um there were a few that were submitted before i think we've had a, maybe one extra one that's come through yeah we might as well answer this one about salary guides to be fair leading on yeah. from that um the question is that 
well, basically just sort of saying that the salary guides cover London and the South East as one. Um, so which for candidates in the home counties isn't overly useful um, because the figures are inflated by the London salary offerings. Fair point. Um, I'd like to speak to you because um, it depends whereabouts you are. But for example, I mean, I'm, I mean, is, is High Wycombe in the home counties? Buckinghamshire? Don't know. Um, but um, I've, 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 I've placed candidates in the home counties recently. I've had offers in home counties. It's probably not as much as you think. Um, there's candidates I've placed in the home counties on higher salaries than candidates I've placed in central London. Um, so, I mean, it's that that's probably the reason why we have those two together, actually, because it's not that that big of a difference. I think what is the big difference is the, the company that you go to. There's some companies in the market that pay under market rate. That's that's their that's just what they do. Obviously, we'd advise them not to do that, but they do. Um, and then you may have a, a company right opposite the street in the same town, and they do pay their staff well. Um, because I think the um sometimes the difficulty with recruiting for companies just outside of the M25, for example, um, is that even if someone they want someone local, but even if someone lives next to the office, they're just gonna go to London. Um, because it's not it's not always money, it just might be there's more of a buzz. We work in London, but I live in 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 the home counties. I like going into London because it's got friends that work there, go for a drink after work, and it's just I think more fun than probably working in Wickham. Um, so that's why I do it. But I say, I mean, that person, I, I can't. It's anonymous. I don't know who you are, but um, it'd be interesting to know who you are, what level, what experience you've got. Um, and then I think again, an important point to note on the salary guides is it's a it's a ballpark figure. Um, so you may be under market rate, but there may be a good reason for that. Um, you may be over market rate, maybe a good reason for that. You, we we can't tailor that to literally everyone. So give us a call and we can have a five, 10 minute conversation with you, ask you a few questions and we can actually give you a number and tell you what you should be on or what you could get. Yeah, um, I think actually with hybrid working becoming more of a, the, the industry norm now, it's the home counties and you know, I think about Kent, Surrey, those sort of areas. They've probably they're in a really weird position now, salary wise, because I think what was a lot of the time the big sell for a company based in Kent was you have to commute into London. You could do yeah, we'll pay you less, but you're not, you're saving on your travel uh, and you're saving and you've got the convenience of it being on your doorstep. Now with more London firms saying you might only have to come into the office twice a week, that convenience level is now not as attractive as it would have been. Um, and actually, now I think the travel costs well. It's expensive, you know, the trade tickets aren't cheap, but I've only got to do it twice. I'm not going to do it five times a week now. So I'm basically saving saving half that travel cost. And now the extra amount of money I'm getting in London maybe justifies making that trip in. Um, so I think that's that's again, it's more for the hiring managers. If you're in one of those sort of surrounding areas, you might have always considered yourself as not part of the London market, but I think the London job market is probably expanding now because realistically more people are willing to actually commute in because they're not having to do it as often. Um, another question that we had, um, I think we've had, we haven't some more submitted there. Um, how possible is it for cancer not from the UK to move into a role into the UK? Um, it's a hard question to answer. It that is it makes a massive difference in terms of your like how what sort of experience you've got to be all, in all honesty, um, and what kind of qualifications you've got. I think if you've if you're a chartered accountant. It makes your life a lot, lot easier. Um, not just to get into insolvency, but to get into, you know, generally just getting a job in the UK makes it a lot easier. Um, it depends where you've maybe gained your experience. Uh, I think where we've typically had most success if someone's come from maybe Australia, maybe New Zealand or, or South Africa, where the insolvency law is quite similar to the UK. That's typically when where we've had a lot more joy there. Um, I know the Indian insolvency law is is based off of the UK as well, but I think the market is there still quite quite young, really. Um, but again, that's very much an individual, but sort of case by case, I'd say. But it, does it happen? It one hundred percent happens. Um, you know, we we all me and Harmony both help people make that move over. Um, so it can happen. Same with if you want, if you're in the UK and you want to make the move overseas, you know, we have got contacts over there as well. Um, so again, if you're if you want some information on that, please do reach out to us. Um, 
Um, we had one here that was uh, any advice for someone new to in, to restructuring. How much you want to cover that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say really similar advice to anyone new to anything. Really, um, depends what kind of advice that person would would want. Um, but I'd say, I mean, I once had a partner say to me that he would view the early part of someone's career as the first ten years. Um, so obviously, you know, you may not be in it for ten years, but if it's if you know you're going to commit to it for the rest of your working life or for an extended period of time. Um, but I think the first 10 years of your career sets the tone and sets the pace for the rest of your career. If you spent the first 10 years of your career working at, uh, you know, a variety of, of, well, not a variety, but a number of different companies that do similar kinds of work, um, then after that 10 years, that's all you'll really ever be able to work at generally. In terms of candidates that come to us, if they, after 10 years, wake up and realize, oh, I want to do something a bit different or I want to work on more complex stuff, that then becomes almost impossible because you compete with people that started that five years into that 10-year period. Um, so I think the important thing, if you're new into restructuring or insolvency, is um, try and think long-term. It's a bit cringy, you know, asking what you want to do, where do you want to be in five years? Ask the question of yourself, um, note it down, and then figure out how how do I get there. Speak to us; we'll tell you. Um, I think another one was was there one about how to get into advisory? Did you say, Chris? Yeah, um, it was a, yeah. advice uh, from someone looking to move away from formal insolvency to focus on advisory work. Fine. Um, so I've helped a few people with that recently. The short answer to that is it's extremely difficult to do if you've only got formal insolvency experience. It's made a lot easier if you're ACA or ACCA. Um, but it's like a chicken and the egg scenario. Um, the yeah, I mean the reality of it is it's it's almost impossible to move into a pure advisory role. But what is possible is moving into a hybrid formal insolvency advisory role. That is possible. Um, so yeah, reach out to us if that's if that's you. Um, place a few people like that recently but I think the that again just links to that first question of if that's what you want to end up doing and you're seven years into your career I mean it's not like a solid thing like after 10 years you, you can't do what you want to do but it's nearing the end of that early part of your career and I think 10 years is probably fairly generous I'd probably say even like after five years doing the same kind of thing you really want to be thinking like what am I actually doing here um, because you're then once you get to that five, 10 plus point, you'll no, you're no longer sort of like new to the market and like the new sort of thing that everyone wants to kind of invest in. Um, people will then say, fine, they've been doing it for such a long time now that it might be difficult to get them out of what they're, what they already know. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, someone's actually asked a similar question. How easy is it to move from insolvency uh, slash financial advisory into private equity? Um, similar in that it's hard to move from formal insolvency into advisory. I'd say, I mean, private equity is incredibly competitive, even if you're coming from a pure M and A background. Yeah, you know, we always sort of kind of say that's that's where most people are kind of seeing as their end game. Um, you know, I do know of a few private equity firms out there that like to hire from a restructuring background because a lot of what they invest in is distressed assets. So. There are very specific private equity firms out there that do really value that kind of experience. But again, it's more around, do you do financial advisory turnaround? I think if your background is typically on, you know, CVLs, MVLs, you know, you might do the odd administration. I think that would be quite a hard jump to go straight from that to private equity. I'll never say it's impossible because, you know, that's, that's a quick way of making yourself look really stupid by saying something is never going to happen. Um, so... I'd say it's highly unlikely. I think if you were wanting to do that, you would need to find a bridging role somewhere that gets you from doing formal insolvency into advisory. You can build up some more skills that's more transferable to private equity. And then you're going to have to then go and fight against all the M&A sort of professionals out there. It can happen, but it's a very competitive market um, for, for anyone trying to break into that, that particular sector. Um, I'm conscious of time. I don't want to take, but obviously, I know we do have a few more questions that had been submitted. So, I do want to try and answer those, I guess, as quick as I can. Um, someone just generally asked around the trends in Scotland. Um, you know, even though we're based in London, we do recruit uh, in Scotland. I'd say Scotland 
feels a little bit slower in terms of how busy it is just by the conversations I've had. Um, it doesn't feel like there's as much of a, oh my God, we're drowning in work here. Um, I think there are companies that are hiring. I think there's there's still people looking to grow, um, but it feels a little bit slower. Um, I think generally, you know, there's, there seems to be more personal insolvency that is getting done in, uh, in Scotland. Again, that's just from anecdotally people I've spoken to. Um, but again, if you're someone that's based in Scotland and they and you would like, I guess, a bit more of a personalised, what should I do in my scenario, then again, we cover that area as well, uh, even though we're all the way down in London. Um, I'll ask, answer the last one um, that, that was said in before, and it's kind of touched on a few of the pots we've already gone over. Um, it was around, uh, I've completed my training contract within an audit role. Uh, are there transferable skills between these streams that are valued? Um, I'd say yes, there are. I mean, you know, audit and having an ACA qualification or ACCA has a lot of transferable skills, not just into this industry, but into a lot of industries. I do think it makes a difference in terms of maybe what sectors you're covering. And I think it also makes, to be honest, maybe, maybe it makes more of a difference in terms of what, what else have you done? Um, you know, have you managed to push yourself and, and work on more interesting clients? Have you managed to get yourself exposed or get a common out, out into maybe a different team, even if it's just for a few months? Um, I think the challenge that people coming out of audit may find if they're trying to move into restructuring is they're entering with relatively little experience or specific experience in this field, but they're comparatively on probably sort of middle management level salaries by that point. And it's kind of it can be hard for some firms to justify bringing someone on on that kind of salary that is still going to need a lot of training on the specifics of the job. Um, so yes, there are transferable skills. There's an argument that maybe if you're maybe a year and a half in and you think maybe audit isn't what you want to do long term, I'm really interested in restructuring. Maybe worth reaching out to other firms and seeing is there a restructuring firm out there that can 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 help me finish my ACA. But I can move into restructuring now rather than wait till you're fully qualified. And then you almost you put yourself in a kind of difficult box where you're kind of priced out of the price yourself out of the market. Um, but I guess with all of these things, ask us. Um, because I know, you know we're giving fairly broad answers to quite broad questions, and, and every individual situation is completely different. Um, as we like to think, you know, again, we can give you some genuinely honest advice uh, on what the next steps may be. It may be to stick things out for a few months. It might be to let's get your CV and let's let's start reaching out to companies right now. And it might be just to go have a conversation with your with your boss uh, and ask for a pay rise. Um, but um, we'll leave things there because I think that's pretty much taken us almost exactly to an hour. Uh, and unconscious people probably have work to do. Um, and um, uh, we don't like the sound of our voice that much. So um, thanks to anyone that's, again, that's submitted, um, you know, answered the survey. Thanks to everyone that's joined. Um, hope you found it useful. And yeah, please do reach out to us if you want any more questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much.